So even on GMAT like questions, now we are going to go back into these questions. Okay. Now um, let's try. You all remember this question. Let me bring back your responses for this one. In the interest of time, I actually let me uh, let me give you another chance to solve this question. Now that you've gone through the process skills, I hope that your accuracy for this question will have improved. So let's solve this question again. Go ahead. All right, let's take a look at your responses now. I see that the accuracy has definitely improved. Um, this was your, uh, so the, one, the, the poll on, on, on the left-hand side is your first attempt, and about 39% of you selected choice A, but now a number of you are, 70% of people who are responding are selecting choice A as the correct answer. So, all right, so this is good. It's very encouraging. And let's go through this real quick over here as to why you faltered earlier and why and what is it that you fixed in this uh, go around, okay? So if x and y are positive integers, which means greater than or equal to one, and x is odd, is the product x, y even? Now, if you are being asked, is x, y even, and we already know that x is odd, Essentially, what we are being asked is, is y even? How many of you drew this inference? How many of you simplified the question statement to this degree? Good, very nice. So, so this was the skill of simplifying, okay? Okay, so if essentially what we need to figure out is, is x even? Now, let's take a look at statement one. Statement one, what is it saying? It's saying, um, again, we start to process it step by step, right? Uh, 6a cube will always be even, 23 is an odd number. Even plus odd is odd, which means x cube into y is odd. Now, you already know that x is odd, which means odd into y is odd, which means y is an odd number. So, you know your answer. You have your answer, which means it's sufficient. Okay. Now, statement 1 is sufficient. Now, let's take a look at statement 2 and see whether statement 2 is sufficient or not. Statement 2 says x squared plus y is 3k plus 1. Now you move everything. You, you need, you're interested in the nature of y, right? So you move everything to the other side. Now 7 is odd, x is odd, which means odd plus odd plus or minus odd is going to be even. But you don't know anything about k. You don't have any information about k, which means that you cannot figure out whether y is even or odd. Okay, so statement 2 is not sufficient, which means choice A is the correct answer. Now, for those of you, now how many of you, um, first, first let me get this information, how many of you did not select A earlier, but selected choice A right now? So 
So the nine or the eleven, so about half of the twelve of you who, who made that selection now. So tell me what changed. What changed between now between earlier and now? What changed between the two attempts? Concepts are clearer now, evaluating, understood it better. Now, again, think about it. When you say concepts are clearer now, essentially you are, you are now being, you are able to apply the concepts a lot better because you are getting more confident with the process skills. Because you are now applying the, you're drawing inferences explicitly. You're consciously drawing inferences. So you're able to apply the concepts. And this was the missing link. This has always been the missing link. You know the concepts, but you're not able to solve difficult questions. Why? Because you don't know how to apply that concepts. And the process skills actually bridge that gap. I am so happy. You guys made my day, seriously. I mean, just this, this little bit of, I mean, these, these, these small improvements is what leads to the ultimate goal of you getting to that 90th percentile. Okay? All right, good, very nice. I got it right the first time and the second time, uh, but I was much faster the second time because I knew how to infer and apply concepts. Very well said. And that's another benefit. That's a, that's a very, very important benefit of applying these process skills because then you're able to solve questions in within the time constraint that the GMAT puts on you. So good. All right, let's move on to question number two now. Go ahead and answer this question again. Can you please click on still solving? Good. All right, um, guys, let's do this. Um, we're going to take a break for about um, nine minutes, for about 10 minutes. Um, uh, I believe there is, sorry, I, and I didn't know about this. Um, uh, I, I believe in India, you're supposed to turn, turn off the lights for about nine minutes at 9 p.m. every day out of respect for fighting towards the, fighting against the corona pandemic. So, um, so let's just, uh, it's already done. Okay, uh, let's just see. How many of you have already turned off the lights at, at your end? Again, I, I didn't know about this and I just got to, uh, and I was just made aware of it. Okay, it's done now. All right, sorry about that. Sorry guys, I didn't know about it. So, okay, so we'll carry on with the session then.
yes we are based out of phoenix arizona so again i didn't know about this part okay sounds good okay all right so let's come back to this question um if a and b are positive integers is a times b to the power 4 a multiple of 2 so again similar thing um, what we need to figure out is is a uh, times b to the power 4 even or is uh, is a b even now what does that mean if a b is even at least one of a or b should be even right so that's what it is okay is uh, at least one of a or b should be even now statement one what does it say statement one says 2a plus b whole cube is even now first of all tell me how many of you actually drew this inference or simplified the question statement in this manner that at least one of a and b should be even even if you get to know that one of a or b is even that's going to be enough for you to answer the question that a and b is even that that the product of a b is even now this is it it's very important to understand the implication of this essentially even if you know that a is even regardless of your lack of knowledge of what b is you would still be able to answer the question okay and that that distinction is very important okay um, so so let's look at this uh, 2b 2a plus b is even which means again so we we continue to draw our inferences so over here we don't know anything about from statement one we don't know anything about the even odd nature of a all we know is that b is for sure even but still because of what the question is asking us because of how we simplify because of the simplification that we arrived at we could figure out that a b is even okay so many of you didn't select choice a as the correct answer people who selected b or c or e which is this where you faltered people who selected choices b c or e is this where you faltered wherein you thought that you needed both a and b so where you faltered was not on your knowledge of even odd numbers where you faltered was that you weren't able to simplify the the information asked in the question statement appropriately that is where you faltered okay so again process skill which process skill were you not able to apply okay now let's look at statement two statement two says a plus three b is odd now over here we need to consider both the cases there are two cases first case is now if a plus three b is odd then obviously one is even the other has to be odd now we consider both the cases a is odd or three b is even or a is even and three b is odd okay does everyone get this how how i'm what what cases am i considering because a plus three b is odd you know that one of them has to be even the other has to be odd so you're considering both the cases wherein you're considering in one case a is odd in the other case a is even okay and that is what uh, you are arriving at now in in both of those cases what you get is at least one of a or b is is even which means that a b is even so you get choice um, b statement 2 as sufficient which means the correct answer here is choice d now only 15 of you selected choice D as the correct answer. So tell me, which, what did you falter at? Why did you make a mistake? Why did you make a mistake? wrong inference of statement one now for those of you who don't have the answer choices for ds here it goes you may have to scroll down this note pane okay wrong inference so again so i'm going to remove the, so i'm going to clear out this poll i want you to tell me which step did you falter at Because only 15 of you were able to select the correct answer. Others selected incorrect. Uh, others in, uh, simplify. Okay. So let me ask this. How many of you were not able to simplify um, 
Tell me, how many of you were not able to arrive at the correct simplification of the question statement? Yes or no? Okay. Were not able to. So, okay, 10 of you were not. Okay. All right. Okay, step one, simplify. So, answer A. Okay, statement two, splitting to A plus 3B has to be odd. So, you weren't able to consider uh, all the cases. Didn't read the question properly. I chose D, just understood reasoning better. Okay. Can you publish? Okay. Uh, all right. So, the previous selected answers for this one are here. Question number two here. So there wasn't much of an improvement over here. Um, so it is okay. That's fine. Okay. So again, I hope that all of you are getting a hang of these process skills and why this is so, it's so important. Okay. Now this one, I'm not going to give you another chance to solve. I'm going to show you the solution on my own over here. Statement one, n cube minus n is always even, right? So we again process it. n into n square minus one is even. Again, you take two cases, n is even, n is odd. And what you arrive at is in all the cases, uh, this, this expression is always even. Okay. So, uh, so this one is always true. Then statement number two, Again, processing it step by step, all the terms over here, all the first three terms over here are even because they because there is at least one even number in the product. So even plus odd is odd, which means that this uh, statement is always false. Okay, statement number three, again, processing it. So again, it's just step by step you are going through, you're drawing inferences and you're arriving at the answer. Okay. All right. Now we will move. Now we are going to move on to our prime process skills related to prime numbers. Okay. So what we have done so far is we have uh, we have done process skills on even odd, and then we were able to see good improvement in your ability to answer um, questions which are difficult questions. Okay. Now we are going to follow the same drill for for prime numbers and you're going to see similar theme over here okay so let's uh, come back over here and now before I go further I um, want to understand how is the session going so far very good okay all right uh, Take a break of five minutes, please. Um, okay, how many of you want a break? Break of five minutes. Because I do want you guys to be fresh. Okay, because quite a bit, it's half and half. Let's take a break of five minutes and then we'll come back. Okay, so, so let's do that. Okay, so we will meet at, uh, it's 8.47 at my end. So let's meet at 8.55. Uh, okay. So about eight eight minutes break.
All right, so I am back. Just one more minute left, and then we will resume with the prime section. All right, so when everyone is back, so as, as you're coming back, click on yes. That way I know that you guys are um, back in the session. So I hope the break was good, rejuvenated, all excited about process skills on primes. Yes, no? Can you display the third question explanation? Again, let's, uh, okay, I, I, I'll show it to you. Here is, uh, here is the third question explanation, okay? But I'll be sharing this PDF with you so you'll have it, right? So again, and again, I don't expect you guys to go through this just this one time with me. There's a lot of content over here. I want you to go through these questions again um, at your own pace and just, you know, be more, um, what do you say, uh, do that self-reflection as to why you made mistake or what is it that you didn't do. Correct. Okay. Just to clarify, was question two answer D? Let's go back. Sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. Let's go back to question number two. Yes, the correct answer is D. You're, you're correct. Okay. All right. So, process skills for primes. Let's do that now. So, I didn't, so I didn't have you guys do question number three again. So, let me give you the, the stats for question number three. Uh, Oh, I actually erased the stats for question number three. About 56% of people got question number three correct. Okay. All right. So let's start here. I'm going to show you the question with three choices. Four choices, sorry. Okay, let's click on still solving. All right, I'm going to discuss the, the solution now. Now, for those of you who have selected choice D, can you tell me what is the answer that you arrived at? People who selected choice D are saying that it's none of the above. So what's the answer that you arrived at? So type that in the, uh, in the poll below. All right, so let's solve this question. Um, what is the value of A minus B if A and B are squares of consecutive natural numbers that are prime? Now, what are uh, consecutive natural numbers that are prime? What are consecutive natural numbers that are prime? 2 and 3. Absolutely. They are 2 and 3. So, what you know is that A and B are squares of consecutive natural numbers that are prime, okay? Which means that A, now we don't know whether A is bigger or B is bigger, right? So A could be 2 square or A could be 3 square, okay? Like, so which means that B could be 3 square or B could be 2 square, which means that the difference between A and B could be either minus 5 or 5 
which means that the correct answer here is choice C. Okay. So again, if you notice from the standpoint of process skills, the first process skill that we applied over here was translate. We translated the information in the question statement and we arrived at the fact that A and B could be 2 and 3. Okay. So, uh, and then we, we looked at both the cases that were possible. Okay. A, um, whether in A is, is 2 square or A is 3 square. Okay. Now, for those of you, now again, quite a few of you faltered over here. Only 40% of the class got the question correct. Okay. Now, when I say conserve, there are two places where you made mistakes. The first one is at the translate piece. Okay, wherein you are saying that you weren't able to get to two, three as a translation. Now, really, this is where you need to you need to work on this process scale. When I say consecutive natural numbers that are prime, I, I'm literally translating English into math. Consecutive natural numbers are um, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, right? But these consecutive natural numbers also need to be prime. So 2, 3 is the on, are the only consecutive natural numbers that are prime. That's why 2, 3. 5, 7, they are not consecutive natural numbers. So again, first you have to apply the condition that they have to be uh, consecutive, and then you apply the condition that they are prime. Okay? So that is the issue. That's the thing that you have to take. Okay? Now, uh, the second thing is, it doesn't say whether A is uh, larger than B or not, right? So that's why you need to consider both the cases. So that's the second part. Okay, so that's the second place where you would have faltered. Now tell me, where did you falter? People who made a mistake, and let me get uh, a poll here. So did you falter at the translation bit or did you falter at the all cases bit? Where did you falter? Or I'm also going to get some other one other. Now people who are saying other, I want you to tell me what is that other? I want you to describe that other. So majority of you, more than half of the class that faltered, faltered because of translation. Okay. Um, then there were quite a bit, quarter of the class, a little bit over quarter of the class faltered because of all cases. Okay. So, um, but it must be A or B. How can it be both? I don't understand that question. I missed the square. Okay, you missed the square itself. Okay. So again, you missed the square. That is also part of the translation bit. You missed the square part. That's That comes under uh, uh, translation. Okay? All right. So, cool. Um, let's move on to next question here. Five choices. I'll bring the poll with five choices. Go ahead. All right. So good. I can see that quite a few of you have selected correct answer. Let's carry on. Um, if A and B are two prime numbers, so A and B are primes, and A is greater than B. Okay, so that's one thing. A and B are primes. And what do we need to figure out? How many values exist such that sum of A and B is 19? Okay, good. 
Now sum of a and b is 19. Now if you notice a and b the sum is odd which means one of these needs to be even and the other needs to be odd. Right? One of the terms a and b needs to be even and the other needs to be odd. So we're going to now, so this is, the, this is an inference that we have drawn. Okay? Now another thing that we know is that a and b are primes. Now, because one has to be even, that means it has to be 2. 2 is the only even prime number. And we know that, okay, A and B are primes and B is the smaller number, which means that B is 2. Now, which means that A is 19, A is 17. So, there is only one combination. Okay. So, I noticed that quite a few, there were a few of you who had selected choice B as the correct answer who have now changed that to choice A because I didn't end the poll. So tell me for those of you who selected the answer incorrectly, where is it that you faltered? For those of you who didn't select choice A as the correct answer, where did you falter? Were you not able to translate? Were you not able to infer? Okay, and for those of you who are saying, other, what is that other? I see that some of you faltered because of uh, translation. You weren't able to translate that information. And some of you um, faltered. Quite a few of you made a mistake with inference. So for those of you who are saying other, did not notice A is greater than B. So, that, so that's going to come under um, translate only didn't apply A greater than B, okay. So again, that's that's going to come under inference. You didn't draw that inference. Not realizing sum is, okay, I got the answer right without using inference by just writing down all the numbers one after another. How bad is this approach? How bad? Again, uh, see, plugging in numbers doesn't work all the time, okay, and that's why I, that's not my go-to approach. Okay, consider all prime numbers till 10 and did that. No, that doesn't work. Um, again, you may have gotten the answer here because here the sum is 19. Um, so it could work, it, it does work here because the sum is a smaller number. But again, as you build your skill um, at this level, by solving the question in a methodical manner, what you're going to see is as you get, get to more difficult questions, you will be more you will be more capable of solving those difficult questions under the timing constraint, right? So that's why I always promote solving the question using the step-by-step -step method, okay? All right, so let's move on to our next question now. Question number three, again, five choices. Let me open the poll. Can you please click on still solving? Okay, go ahead. All right, I'm going to stop, I'm going to end the poll here, okay? Now, this is where, um, in this question, we are going to see the plugging in of numbers or, or taking numbers as, a, as the right strategy. But I want, you to, I want you to look at when is it that I start to take in numbers, okay? So, so let's look at that now. 
So essentially what's given to us is that n has only two prime factors. Okay, if the number n has only two prime factors and n is less than 20. Now if a number has only two prime factors, that means I can express that number in this form p1 to the power a times p2 to the power b. How many of you did this part here? How many of you expressed it in the form p1 to the power a into p2 to the power b? Okay. For those of you who didn't do that, you didn't translate, you weren't able to apply the translate process. Here. Okay, so I want you to make a note of that. Okay, now n is less than 20. Okay, so that's also given to us. Find the number of possible values of n. So we need to know what are all the possible values of n. Now what is the smallest uh, prime number? It's 2. Right, so smallest, uh, so p1 at the minimum will be 2. Which means what could be the largest uh, prime number over here again this is where we use the information n is less than 20 because n is less than 20 so the largest prime number will be 20 divided by 2 which is uh, which is 10 again 10 is not a prime number so the largest prime number will be less than 10 which is 7 okay so if you notice what I'm doing is I'm trying to utilize the information that's given to me in the question statement and I'm arriving at what are what is the range of the possible values of my prime numbers over here okay so the so the prime numbers that i that i need to consider go from 2 to 7 okay no no more than 7 okay so that is so what i'm doing is i'm trying to figure out my constraints okay and that is a very very important thing before you start plugging in numbers or before you start to consider what numbers to consider okay now next what i do is i take up p1 p2 and n and i try i, I start to visualize what am i doing i'm taking up uh, starting from the smallest prime number and i'm then saying okay 2 times 3 is 6 2 squared because again my my because n has two prime factors which means that any of the powers can also come in Right, so 2 squared times 3 is, is, is 12. So that's my second possibility. Now, if I go to cube times 3, 24, this is going to go beyond the boundary of n is less than 20, which means that's not a possibility. So by this, what I'm doing is step by step, um, I, I, I'm, I'm first taking up two numbers, 2 and 3, then I'm increasing the powers, then I'm going by increasing the powers of the second uh, prime factor, which is 3 squared. Again, 3 squared over here, 2 squared times 3 squared is not going to work. So by this way, I'm working out on all, I'm, I'm plugging in numbers, I'm taking up numbers, but they, I'm doing, there is a certain, um, a certain criteria, you utilizing which I'm taking these numbers, right? And essentially, this is where I'm utilizing the process skill of visualizing. I'm visualizing what all combinations are possible. Okay, but I'm doing that visualization not outside, not in any uh, open universe. I'm doing that visualization in the constraints that I'm working towards, in the constraints that I have figured out from the question statement. And by doing this, what I get is 6 as the correct answer, which means choice D is the correct answer. Now, as you can see from the results, only 17 of you selected choice D as the correct answer. So my first question is to those 17 people, did you follow, did you select choice D as the correct answer for the right reasons? And by that, what I mean is, did you follow the process that is presented to you on the slide? No. Okay. So let's first talk about this. Why, what is the process that you followed? So slowly we're going to talk. We are going to take up all the um, all the other cases as well. Why seven? Again, we are just trying to figure out what is the upper limit of my um, of of P two. Okay. So you figured out from the options. You failed to translate. You didn't consider twelve and eighteen. Okay. So do you see? Okay, let me ask you this question. Do you guys see the value of doing this uh, thing in a step-by-step -step manner? Yes or no? Do you see the value of going from applying translation to do, getting to that next level, then figuring out your constraints, and then doing the visualization? 
good i see five of you who don't see the value um so again i'm not going to talk so again you guys have to figure out why is it that you don't see the cc value in it okay now tell me which of the steps did you falter at and i know that you may have faltered at multiple steps so let me edit the poll and i'll change it to multiple answers so you see here translate visualize and constraints which ones did you falter at translate is the biggest one visualize as well and constraints also but translate and visualize are the ones where you faltered the most okay okay all right now this session is going to go a little uh, it's going to go at least till 10 o'clock um, another 45 minutes but i'm going to stop it at 45 minutes because i know you won't be able to take a lot uh, any more of this um, uh, uh, this content because again there's a there's a upper limit to how much you can absorb okay so i'm going to end that um, at 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 uh, at 10 minutes so till that time just concentrate here get as much as you can from from the session okay all right so now let's move on to question number 4 this is a similar question but there is a big difference so I want you to apply the learnings um, from the previous question over here, but there's a slight difference, that there's a big difference, and I want you to focus on that. All right, I am going to end the poll now. So this one, again, similar stuff. N is a product of two prime numbers. Now here, N is the product of two prime numbers. So here we don't need to consider the powers. We actually, if we consider the powers, that would be wrong because then um, they won't be uh, prime numbers there, right? So N is product of two prime numbers. So N is equal to P1 into P2, okay? Now, again, same drill. So the, the drill that you see over here is exactly the same as, as we did for question number three. Now here, when we visualize, again, we visualize utilizing what is it that we are doing. We don't have to consider multiple powers. It's just the product of two prime numbers, and we get four options over here. Okay, so, uh, so question number four, very similar to what we did in question number three. Again, translate process skill visual translate figuring out the constraints and then visualization okay all right now let's go to question number 5 
All right, I'm going to end the poll now. So I know that quite a few of you have arrived at the answer. Um, what is the greatest prime number that divides 8 to the power 15 minus 4 to the power 20? Now this is the question that absolutely requires you to apply the simplification process skill. So you observe the numbers over here, and these numbers look a bit scary at the outset, right? But always understand that um, GMAT is not going to throw anything at you that you can't handle, right? So always go into your arsenal of simplification, okay? Make sure that you simplify this. So 8 to the power 15 minus 4 to the power 20 is this. You essentially start to simplify this. What you get is 2 to the power 40 times um, 31, okay? Now, what is the greatest prime number? Obviously, 31 is the greatest prime number That's that, that um, divides this expression. Okay, so choice E is the correct answer. So basic thing over here was drawing that final inference, but before that, simplification was the key. All right, let's look at question number six now. And there you go. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. So I see that uh, seven of you were not able to select the correct answer till now, uh, any answer till now. And 68% of the class selected the correct answer choice E. So let's go through this question. So if 42P divided by 660 is an integer, then which of the following can be the value of P? Now the key thing over here is what we need is a potential value. Okay, how many of you observed this that what we need is a potential value, not a hard and fast value. What we need is what can be the value of P. And this is a very important uh, point, especially for data sufficiency questions. Okay, and, and even in problem solving questions. At times, what we are looking for is an absolute value that, okay, this, this is the only possible value. And, uh, and we end up not seeing that value in the answer choices. And that's where it's very important to translate to know exactly what it is that you're looking for. Okay. Now, 660 divides 42p completely. So what is it that we should be doing? We should be factoring both 42 and 660 to figure out what is it that we get. Now, 42p, 42, we uh, simplify as 2 into 20, or 2 into 3 into 7. Again, you can look at the processing. Now, what we end up getting over here is that 7 divide, 7p divided by 2 into 5 into 11 is an integer, which means that, now again, between 7 and 2, 5, 11, there is no common factors, right? So essentially, if for this expression to be an integer, 2, 5, 11, 2 times 5 times 11 should completely divide p, which means that p is a multiple of 110, which means that possible values you look at the answer choices and you see that 220 is the multiple of, 100, uh, 20, uh, of, of 110, which means choice E is the correct answer. Now, for those of you who faltered here, why is it that you faltered? For those of you who were not able to select uh, any answer or who were not able to select choice E as the correct answer, where did you falter?
didn't understand the question, took too long. Answer was correct, took too long. Okay, searching for 110 and see this is again, so translate is where you, you weren't able to, you basically faltered and again let's, uh, so if you were searching for 110, that means you weren't able to translate. Okay, uh, was late, was one second late, that's okay. Did not factorize, so you didn't simplify. Okay, so that's, uh, so you took an issue with you weren't able to simplify. Okay, didn't understand the question, which means that you didn't, what you weren't able to translate. Okay, so again, I hope that you are all people who are taking longer. Okay, I would say that you need to, you, you, for this question, again, you need to get more comfortable with the process skills. Okay, ultimately, you should be able to um, solve this question under the timing constraint as well. Okay. All right. So, quite a few of you were not able to simplify. Some of you were not able to translate. Okay. All right. So, I hope that this kind of exercise is telling you what is it that you need to focus on. Yes or no? Is this causal analysis helping you figure out where is it that you need to focus on? Where is it that you need to put in your energy while you're solving questions? Okay. And remember, upfront itself, I said that this, uh, that what I'm looking out, what I'm, what I want you guys to start doing is, as you review solutions, you should be able to figure out did you fault, which process skill did you not apply, or what conceptual understanding did you not have. Okay, that's when you start to do that, that's when all the practice that you do goes in the right direction. Otherwise, your practice becomes more like an aimless, uh, you know, just throwing the darts and, and hoping that some dart is going to uh, hit the bullseye. Okay. All right. Question number seven now. Go ahead. All right, I'm going to end the poll now and I'm going to solve this question. And guys, you may notice that I'm going a little bit faster now. Um, again, I do want to cover all the questions, uh, the process skill questions, uh, there are a total of 13, uh, plus the other five questions that we discussed up front. Now, you will have, as I said earlier, you will need to go through this presentation again and the recording again, and that would, I would highly recommend that. I would strongly recommend that. So, again, I will share the presentation with you, but I do want to go through all the questions once with me over here uh, as, as I have all of you over here, okay? So let's look at that. Um, if 2k to the power 5 has five distinct prime factors where k is an odd integer, how many prime factors does k square have, okay? So over here again, what we know is that 2k has five distinct prime factors, okay? Which means that 2 is one of the five prime factors of 2k, right? Again, I want you to understand this. This is a very important inference. Uh, now, 2 is not a prime factor of k because k is odd, right? k is odd. So, you know that 2 is not a prime factor of k, which means that k has 4 prime factors, okay? Now, which means that k square also has 4 prime factors, okay? So, the correct answer over here is choice C, okay? It is 2k to the power 5. It is not whole... Uh, 2 is not raised to the power 5. 
Okay. All right. Now let's move on to question number eight here. K is to the power five. Yes. Let's look at question number eight. Well, the answer with the distinct missing should not be greater than or equal to 8. I know you've posted the question in the Q&A part, so Sandeep or Ash Ashutosh would respond to that. Again, that's where the conceptual understanding comes into picture. Okay. And drawing the inference. All right, this one should be relatively straightforward. I'm going to broadcast the results now. The correct answer over here is choice C. Okay, and I know few of you have selected choice A. Which of the following does not have any prime factor that lies between one and itself? And this is a classic example of translate process here. Essentially, what the question is asking us is which of the following is a prime number? Because only a prime number has no prime factor that lies between one and itself. Okay, so the correct answer over here is 5. 5 is the only prime number over here. Now, again, 1 is, is neither prime nor, nor composite. Okay, so again, translation is the most important thing. And if you think about it, this is a prime definition. This is the definition of a prime number, right? So the, the question could have been straightforward, which of the following is not a prime or which of the following is a prime number, right? But over here, the, 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 uh, the thing that we are trying to test you on is, can you, can you translate information correctly? Okay, and that's, that's what uh, this question is testing, okay? Now, how many trailing zeros does this product have? Another example of translate. All right, I am going to broadcast the results. 54% of the class got, 55% of the class got this question correct. Now, again, this is a very, very important example of translation, okay? How many trailing zeros does this product have? Now, this product looks pretty intense here, quite, quite a big number, quite a few big numbers here. But the main thing that you have to do is you have to understand what does trailing zeros mean? Okay, trailing zeros come from 2 and 5. Trailing means how many zeros do you have towards the end, right? So trailing zeros will come from the product of 2 and 5. So essentially, the number of times 2 times 5 appear in the prime factorized form of this product is going to give you the trailing zero. So essentially, all you have to figure out is how many times you see 2 times 5. So how many, how many powers of 2 and 5 do you see together? Okay, so that's what you need to figure out. So it's purely translation and then drawing your inferences based on your conceptual understanding of prime factorization. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the details of prime factorization over here, but what I see over here is 2 times 5 raised to the power 4 times 2 to the power 4. Now again, 2 has power of 8, 5 has power of 4. Now together 2 and 5 which will give, give you 10 is going to have power of 4. Okay, so 4 is the correct answer over here. Okay, now for those of you who faltered, where did you falter? Those of you who didn't select uh, choice A as the correct answer, you faltered because you weren't able to translate. Okay, now what is the other issue over here? Translation is one. What is the other? Quite a few of you have, have listed out other.
Oh, time was an issue. Okay, all right. Uh, all right. Fair enough. Okay, question number 10. Let's go ahead. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. So if P is a positive integer and it has 40 distinct factors, so 40 total factors, then what is the maximum number of prime factors that P can have? Okay. Now, this one I would say is a bit more involved application of the conceptual understanding that you have. And there are a couple of conceptual things that you need. Maximum number of prime factors that P can have, it's a, so first of all, you need to know what is the total number of factors. Total number of factors is n plus 1 into n plus 1, so on, right? So it's a product of the powers of each of the prime factors, right? Now, if you need maximum number of prime factors, when would that be maximum? When you have as many terms, a product of as many numbers as possible. That's the inference that you have to draw over here. Okay, And this inference you are drawing from your translation of the question statement and your conceptual understanding of what um, total number of factors are. Total number of factors are product of n plus 1 into n plus 1, product of powers plus 1 of each of the prime factors. Now if the question statement requires you to have maximum number of prime factors, that means you need to have product of as many numbers as possible. Okay, Which means that now 40, how can you express 40 in terms of as many products as possible, uh, products of as, as many numbers as possible? You, you express it as 2 times 2 times 5 times 2 which means four prime factors, okay? So again, this question requires you to have that solid understanding of the conceptual um, logic behind what are the total number of factors and then the translation bit, okay? So it's a very, very um, uh, involved inference that you have to draw, but this is something that you should be able to do. That's the level of confidence that you need to have in your conceptual understanding. Okay. All right. So let's move on to next question now. Okay. So the questions are two and five are the only prime factors. Yes. So again, guys, I know some of you would not be able to get it, but again, in the interest of time, I need to move forward. Um, Again, this requires you, as I said, this is a more involved uh, inference. It requires you to have a solid understanding of how total factors work. Now, what I can do is I, I would want you to go through primes 1 and primes 2 concept files. In, uh, in those concept files, we explain to you the total number of factors. So go through that. Once you go through that, you will be able to understand it. Okay. Again, some of you are getting confused with the total uh, with, with prime factors. So we are not talking about 2 and 5 as prime factors. We are talking about 2, 2, 2 and 5 as n plus 1 into n plus 1, so on. So you don't have a solid conceptual understanding of how total number of factors work. That's why you're not able to get this question. Okay. So again, go through those concept files. You will be able to understand it. All right. So take that as a feedback. Okay. Um, next question here.
Guys, I'm going to follow through with this one. Um, all right, I, I know that you didn't get a chance to solve the entire question. Um, this one is relatively straightforward. I want you to solve this question on your own later on. Uh, essentially, what we are doing is, again, translation process skill at play over here. Uh, which of the following cannot be a prime number? Essentially, when you say cannot be a prime number, it should not be divisible by any factor. Okay, so you shouldn't be able to factorize um, the expression over there. So essentially, now you need to check each each of the choices and see which ones can be factorized. So that that's what you do. Four and plus five, um, what you end up getting, you cannot factorize this further. There's nothing common between four and five, right? Um, six and plus seven, you cannot factorize this further. There's no factor common between six and seven. 4 and plus 7, again, nothing common between 4 and 7. 6 and 9, there's definitely 3 as a common factor between 6 and 9. So this one can be factorized further, which means that this is not a prime number. This cannot be a prime number. Okay. So again, the main thing over here is you translate the information and you come up with the mechanism to solve this question, which is to say which one can cannot be factorized further. Okay. All right. Um, actually, let's leave this one too. I want to get to uh, the official, uh, the the full length questions right now. So I want you to solve questions um, 12 and 13 on your own. Okay. Later on, you have the entire solution in front of you. So definitely solve questions uh, 10 and 13 on your own. Okay. Now let's uh, go to question number one over here. So we are going back to, so now we are looking at uh, question um, question number four that you solved, okay? So you all said, uh, so 40% of uh, people who made a selection, uh, a selected choice, C as the correct answer, okay? So I'm going to go through the solution of this one. I don't have the time to give you guys another chance to solve this question, okay? So I'm going to go through the solution here. And I'm going to be sharing the PDF with you, so you will have 11, the, the previous, the questions which I've skipped for now, 12, 12, 12 and 13, you will have those questions as well in your PDF. An even integer, uh, P has three distinct prime factors and 27 total factors, okay? If all the three prime factors are consecutive prime numbers, then what is the value of P, okay? Now, we need to find out the value of P. Now, what is given to us? P has three distinct prime factors, which means I can write P as P1 to the power A times P2 to the power B times P3 to the power C. Again, very, very important to write the powers, okay? Now, P is an even integer, which means that one of the prime factors has to be 2. That's very, very important, okay? Now, it has 27 total factors. What does that mean? that I can write 27 as a plus 1 into b plus 1 into c plus 1. Okay, that's my conceptual application. Okay, which means that I can express, how can I express 27 as product of three numbers? Why do I need three numbers? Because I have three numbers over here. Okay, I have three prime factors. So 27 can be expressed as power of three numbers, uh, as product of three numbers as 3 times 3 times 3, which means a, b, and c are all equal to 2. Now because, uh, 2 is the first prime factor, and all the three prime factors are consecutive prime numbers. I have 2, 3, and 5 as my prime factors, and I have their powers, which means I can calculate the value of P as 900. Okay, so again, um, people who got to the correct answer, well and good. Now, people who weren't able to select the correct answer, where did you falter? Which step did you falter on? early on when you solve this question the first time around. Which of the inferences you weren't able to translate the information, didn't understand 27 total factors, the powers, okay. So you faltered at, at various points of these inferences. And again, if you think about it, if I ask you, do you know your concepts of primes well enough, you all said, yes, I do know my concepts. but. The question is, do you know them well enough for you to be able to draw these inferences in order to solve the questions correctly? That is the part that you have to ask yourself. Continuously ask yourself till the time and continuously try to improve till the time you don't get to that point wherein you can draw inferences based on these concepts. Okay? 
All right, let's go on to question number two now. I'm going to give you the solution. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you the solutions. Okay, so let's look at how you responded for question number five. So the correct answer is choice D and 48% of people selected choice D as the correct answer. Okay, so what do we have here? Find the value of 5a plus 10b if a and b are positive integers. a and b are positive integers such that a is greater than b and product of a and b is prime. Now, one of you actually asked me the question, how can product of uh, two numbers be prime? And that's a very good question. Now, frankly, if a, b is prime, if product of a, b is prime, then one of them, one of the numbers has to be 1. That's the only condition when, a, when the product of a and b will be prime. Okay, now you also know that A is greater than B, which means that the smaller of the two numbers, which is B, is actually 1, and which also means that A is a prime number. So all of this translation needs to be done and inferences need to be drawn up front on from the question statement. So essentially for us, we know what B is. We, question statement itself has actually given us a value of B. B is 1. And we need to figure out A, and we also know that A is a prime number. Okay, how many of you were able to solve this question till this point? How many of you drew, uh, did so much analysis on the question statement? Okay, that's good to know. All right. Now, what else do we know? We know that um, A and B are uh, integers. Okay. Now, let's take a look at statement one. Statement one says 100 less than 100 is less than 100. A is less than 300. We need to simplify this. Okay. Unnecessarily, it's, it's uh, uh, they've used big numbers here. So one is less than A is less than three. Now, because A is an integer, this means A is equal to two. I have my answer for A, which means choice statement one is sufficient. Okay, now statement number two, A, B is even. Now, B is already one, and if A, B is even, then an A is prime, so A, two is the only even prime number, which means that I have the value of A, so statement two is also sufficient. So, D is the correct answer. Now, for those of you who didn't select D as the correct answer, where did you falter? What step did you falter? What step or steps did you falter at? Forgot that A is prime, or I would say you didn't infer that A is prime. Getting A's value translation. Okay. I'm happy to see that you guys are not saying that, you know, I didn't know the concept. You're really using the process skill terms, which is really good. Application of statement two. Okay. All right. Now, question number three. This is a question which is based purely on translate. Okay, you have to, and again, you have to um, look at these questions, the question, the, this one, and you have to basically get in the habit of visualizing so that you can translate. Essentially, uh, several cards are kept in a jar. Every every guest has to pick out one one card, and each of the cards has either two, three, five, or seven written. If the product of the numbers written on all the cards picked by all the guests is this, essentially, when you say product of uh, of, of the numbers picked is this, essentially what you have is, uh, let's say, 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 3 times 5 times 7, again, so on and so forth. Again, you, you can visualize this 113, um, uh, 400 as prime factorized, as in the form of prime factorized uh, form, and the answer to this question will be the power of 3. Okay, that's what the answer is going to be. Okay. So you prime factorize, and again, the key thing over here is you don't need to prime factorize to all, all the way to all the, uh, to all the uh, prime factors. You're just concerned about the power of three, so you can simply stop when you know that the further uh, prime factorization is not going to get you any more powers of three. Again, that's a time-saving tip. Okay, so the correct answer over here is four. Choice C is the correct answer. Okay, now for I'm pretty sure people who were not able to solve this question, they were not able to solve it because they didn't, um, they weren't able to translate this information. Okay, all 
All right, let's look at this one. Question number uh, six here. Let's get. Question number six. Uh, if A and B have odd number of factors. Now, actually I'm going to show you the solution. There are some of you who may not be able to get it because this is another concept which is related to total number of, um, uh, total number of factors. Okay. Essentially, if A and B have odd number of factors, this implies that A and B are squares of numbers. So this is a conceptual understanding that you need to have and this conceptual understanding comes from the concept of uh, total number of factors. So that, that's why some of you who are not comfortable with that, you won't be able to get to this inference. But let's say that you get to this inference. Now beyond that, essentially what you have is if you take a look at statement 1, square root of b minus square root of a, you have two, you have one equation and two variables, so you can't really arrive at, the, at, at a single answer. Let's take a, take a look at statement 2 square root of a is even and has only two factors, which means it's uh, prime and it's even, okay? So again, this is an uh, inference that you have to draw, which means that square root of a is equal to two, which means a is four, but we have no idea about b, so statement two is also not sufficient, okay? But when you combine both the statements, now you have two, uh, you have one equation and you have one value already and two variables, so you can actually figure out the value of b. Okay, so both these things together are sufficient. So the key to this question was drawing this inference. If you were able to draw this inference, then the solution is straightforward. And again, that's why it's very, very important to analyze the question statement and simplify it to the degree such that now you have extracted everything from the question statement. Okay, that's very, very important. Okay, all right. Let's move on to this question over here. This was an interesting question. And again, you will, as I go through the solution, you will be able to understand, uh, you'll be able to appreciate how straightforward it is. All this is saying is, and again, it's the GMAT's way of um, making things look difficult when they are not truly difficult. And that's why translation and simplification is really very important. Okay. Um, PR double ampersand Q means that P to the power R plus 1 is a factor of Q, but P to the power R plus 2 is not a factor of Q. Okay, this is the definition of this operation here. Okay, and what you need to do is first thing that you have to do is you have to apply this definition on this term over here 3R double ampersand 108. Okay, and when you do that, what you get is that. 3r to the 1, uh, this is 3 raised to the power r plus 1 is a factor of 108, but 3 raised to the power r plus 2 is not a factor of 108, which means that in 108, power of 3 in the prime factorization of 108 is r plus 1. That's what it says. Okay? So, that's the inference that you have to draw. Okay, this was question number eight. Thank you, Sandeep, for telling me that. Here. Sorry, yes, this is question number eight. All right. So, essentially what you have to get is the power of three in 108. And that is the answer over here. Choice, uh, question number, uh, cho choice B is the correct answer. Okay. Now, if you think about it, the crux of this question, this complicated looking question, is simply in taking the information in the question statement, translating that. Okay. Once you translate it and once you draw this inference, then it's a cakewalk. Essentially, the question should have been very simply, if all it was testing was your conceptual understanding, this question should have been, what is the power of 3 in the prime factorization of 108? But that's not what the question is testing you on. The, the test maker is testing you on how well can you translate information, how well can you draw inferences, okay? And that is the part that you need to work on. That's the part that you need to beef up on, okay? 
So essentially, this brings me to the end, last slide of this uh, session here. After solving every question, attribute cause for every mistake. Okay, the cause can be a conceptual gap, or most likely it is going to be a process mishap that you were not able to apply one of these, at least one of these process skills. Okay. All right. So pretty long session. Okay. I want to get your. What do you guys feel now? How do you guys? Uh, let me get a poll here. What did you like in the session? What did you uh, exhausted? I I know. I'm exhausted, so I'm pretty sure you guys are also exhausted. Yeah. Um, let me, I'll share the PDF with you. So let me go to the other poll. Um, here, so I would want you to rate this session, okay? And I want you to, um, here's the PDF, so definitely download this PDF. The other thing which I would, what do you guys think about the process skills? What do you guys think about process skills? Let me get this over here. Um, I'll get another question. Yes, so tell me, what do you guys think about process skills specifically? Because I want you to start, are you going to be applying the process skills now? Are you going to be consciously um, uh, Are you going to be consciously uh, doing causal analysis based on the process skills? Good. Very important to crack questions. Absolutely. Very nice. Okay. Um, they help you to be conscious of traps. I just visualize the process, but gets messy in your head. As you will notice, as you start to apply these process skills, you will start to get a lot more um, uh, comfortable with the approach of the questions. Okay? Okay. Now, one thing that I would want you to go through is... Um, go through the uh, course that I have recently created and it's in our playlist on on EGMAT. Um, I'm, I'm just getting the list of the playlist. It's a process skill um, playlist here. Just trying to get at that. So definitely uh, look at uh, this playlist and go through each and every um, process skill explanation and uh, definitely subscribe to the um, to the channel if you haven't already done so. How many of you have subscribed to the EGMAT YouTube channel? Because every week we're going to be launching, um, launching uh, uh, videos for each and every process skill. So if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, definitely do that. There's going to be a lot of learnings. And, um, and again, um, as you start to um, do causal analysis based on these uh, process skills, uh, definitely write to us. Uh, we, we love to hear from you. And we'd love to see how well you are improving, because I'm very sure that you are going to improve um, at a very, very fast pace if you start to be conscious about these process skills. Okay, uh, Geometry would be interesting to see how process skills can be applied. Absolutely, and we I'll see if uh, we can do a similar session on, on geometry process skills. Absolutely. Okay. All right then. So good luck, all of you. Thank you for sustaining through this uh, excruciatingly long session. But I'm sure it it was well worth your time, and that you will be able to um, apply this and get to that next level on your quant. Okay. 
All right, thank you. And one more thing, if you guys uh, want to uh, create your personalized study plan, then I would uh, recommend that you do so. Give me one second, I will get you the link for that. All right, trying to find the link. Yeah, so if you are looking to um, figure out how to prepare for your test, how to create your personalized study plan, then definitely click on um, uh, schedule your uh, session with us and we'll help you get started with your preparation. Okay? All right then, guys. Thank you very much. Good luck and let us know how you um, utilize these process skills. Bye-bye.